next on Unsolved Mysteries. After a vicious letter writing campaign in Circleville, Ohio, one man is dead and another may have been convicted for a crime he did not commit. Hundreds of people claim they've seen a sea monster in Lake Champlain. Does Champ really exist? It was a brutal and senseless murder. Who could have killed 18-year-old Lisa Marie Kimmel? And could the Shroud of Turin be a forgery? Two researchers claim that they can replicate some of its unique qualities. There is just nothing like a good mystery, and they're even better when they're true. I'm Dennis Farina. Join me, won't you? received lots of mail from our viewers, but one postcard stands out from the rest. In fact, it was a threat designed to keep us from telling this story. It reads, forget Circleville, Ohio. If you come to Ohio, you L sickos will pay. It's signed, the Circleville writer. But we don't scare that easily. So here's the story. Circleville, Ohio, a small town 25 miles south of Columbus. It's a place that rarely attracted outside attention. But then, frightening letters started to arrive. The first letter was received by Mary Gillespie, a school bus driver, telling her that the letter writer was aware that she was having an affair with the superintendent of schools and that it had better stop. In addition to allegations of an affair, the letter carried an ominous threat. I know where you live. I've been observing your house and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious. The envelope was postmarked Columbus, Ohio. There was no return address, no signature inside, and no way to tell who sent it. A week later, Mary received another letter with a similar tone. Mary? Mary kept the letters to herself until her husband, Ron, received one too. What's going on? All right, I already got two of these, okay? And I didn't say anything because it's not true. What you do you have mean to know you got two of these? Why didn't you say something? And this letter addressed to Ron Gillespie told him that if he didn't do something to stop this affair, that his life was undoubtedly in danger. The alleged affair became the talk of Circleville. The mysterious writer understood the power of gossip. The next letter was even more threatening. Gillespie, you have had two weeks and done nothing. Make her admit the truth and inform the school board. If not, I will broadcast it on CBs, posters, signs, and billboards until the truth comes out. Mary and Ron evidently told three people about the letters. Ron's sister, her husband, Paul Freshour, and Paul's what was sister. That movie? It was in black and white. Mary had some ideas about who was sending the letters. And she had a plan. We thought we'd scare the guy. We did four or five letters only. You know, there was no violence in him or anything, just that we knew who he was and what he was doing, and we sent him the letters. For a while, the plan worked. The threatening letters stopped. And then one night, Hello? Ron got a phone call. Who is this? No, you listen to me. We're sick of this, OK? No more letters, no more phone calls. We're sick of the whole thing. Just end it, all right? The call seemed to confirm Ron's suspicions about the identity you got it. of the letter writer. He told the children he was going out, he was going to confront the letter writer. He took his weapon. He did not seem to 
be drunk, said goodbye to his children, and went out. Angry and upset, Ron hurried to the family's red and white pickup, even though the letter writer had said that he was watching it. Within a short distance at an intersection that he knew very well, he lost control of the vehicle, hit a tree, and was killed. Somewhere in between leaving the house and hitting that tree, his gun had fired one shot. And there was never any explanation for when or how, at whom, that gun could have been fired. The police eliminated one potential suspect and then ruled Ron Gillespie's death an accident. But several Circleville residents soon received anonymous letters accusing the sheriff of a cover-up. First of all, the sheriff agreed with me there was foul play. And then when I contacted him again, he'd change his attitude completely. Then he was telling me that it wasn't foul play, that it was uh, the suspect had passed a polygraph test. Gillespie had 0.16% alcohol, which would, in Ohio, be one and a half times the legal limit. Most people I've talked to said that he was not a heavy drinker and were surprised by that, that kind of finding. Was Ron Gillespie's death an accident? Was he really drunk that night? And why had one bullet been fired from his handgun? After Ron's death, the letters kept coming. His wife, Mary, and the superintendent of schools eventually admitted to a relationship, but said it began after the letters were sent. Mary kept her job driving the school bus, but now the letter writer had begun putting up signs along her bus route. Mary's daughter was being targeted. For Mary Gillespie, it was finally too much. She ripped the sign down. Much to her surprise, behind the sign was this box and a string and also another post that was attached to the fence post. She took it into the bus and she opened it up. There was a small pistol. When she looked closer, Mary realized that it was a crude booby trap designed to fire the gun at her. Investigators discovered that someone had tried to rub the serial number off the gun. But when lab tests were able to read it accurately, the case took on an incredible turn. Next, police discover the surprising identity of the gun's owner. For more than seven years, the Circleville letter writer continued to threaten Mary Gillespie. Then the threats became deadly when Mary was almost killed by a crude booby trap. The police learned from tracing the gun's serial number that it belonged to Mary's brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. He had just split up with his wife, Ron Gillespie's sister. I admitted the gun was mine, but I hadn't seen it for a long time. I'd had no reason to, to check up on or anything, and I don't know when it come up missing. I really don't know what happened to it. And I told him that, and that's, you know, that's the truth. And that's how it was. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe asked Paul to take a handwriting test. Paul agreed. He would give me an actual letter and ask me maybe to do the envelope part, just as near as I could in the envelope. And then on some, he would take the actual letter out and have me to do them as near as I could on the letters. And I did them because I knew I wasn't responsible for the letters. That is not the proper way to test to see if someone has a certain writing style, because if they're copying from a letter, they're going to try to emulate the style. And the experts said that the testing was improper. So they didn't really say that these letters were written by Paul Freshour. They said that they could have been. The sheriff also searched Paul's garage. He turned over all the evidence he gathered to the courts. He called in the prosecutor and told the prosecutor that it was my writing on the booby trap. And then the prosecutor is the one that actually told me that 
that uh, there was a booby trap found, and I was under arrest for attempted murder placed on a $50,000 cash uh, bond. Paul Freshour was put on trial for the attempted murder of his sister-in-law, Mary Gillespie. He wasn't charged with writing the threatening letters, but they were used against him as crucial evidence. What you're about to hear is taken from transcripts of the actual testimony. And did you explain to the handwriting analyst how you went about obtaining the samples? Yes, I did. It is my opinion that the handwriting on the envelopes, documents, and postcards were printed by the same person, it being the known handwriting, or hand printing, of Paul Freshout. Have you, at any time, suspected the defendant of being the one responsible for writing these letters and putting these signs up? Not at first. Mary began to suspect Paul Freshour after a tip from a surprising source. And his wife came to see me and indicated it might be a possibility. And can you look at this? Paul's document? boss testified that Freshour hadn't come to work the day the booby trap was found. Even though Freshour had a solid alibi for almost the entire day, he never took the stand in his own defense. It was a decision he would come to regret. We, the jury, find the defendant, Paul L. Freshour, guilty of attempted murder. I couldn't believe it. I, I was just in shock. I can't blame the jury, because the jury didn't hear all the evidence. But I was just, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was really in shock. Paul Freshour was given the maximum sentence for attempted murder, seven to 25 years. Everyone assumed that he had written the Circleville letters. Everyone figured that they would stop when Paul was in prison, and everyone was wrong. They were being received all over a large area of central Ohio. So a lot of people couldn't understand how Paul Freshour could be mailing all these letters from prison. Paul was placed in solitary confinement, so the letters would stop. But they still continued. All of them were postmarked Columbus, even though Paul was in prison across the state in Lima. Full-scale investigations were conducted twice, possibly three times, during which Paul Freshour was put into isolation, and the warden of the prison he was in during one of these investigations then wrote a letter to Paul's wife saying that as far as he was concerned, it was impossible for Paul to be writing these letters and sending them from prison. You go into a single man cell and, and that's it. You know, it's nothing in there with you. No pencils, no papers, no nothing. For seven years, Paul Freshour was a model prisoner. But when he became eligible for parole, the board rejected his request based on the volume of letters still being sent. A few days after his hearing, Paul himself received a sadistic letter from the Phantom Rider. Now, when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? When journalist Martin Yant reviewed the sheriff's investigative file, he uncovered evidence never mentioned at the trial. Mary Gillespie told the sheriff one of the other bus drivers told her that she had been driving that same road about 20 minutes before Mary Gillespie found that booby trap at exactly that site. And when she went by that very same intersection, there was a yellow El Camino parked there. A large man with sandy hair was standing there. When he saw her come, he turned around and acted like he was going to the bathroom or something, uh, but seemed also to be avoiding any kind of identification. The description of the individual does not fit Paul Freshour at all. And Paul had a very solid alibi for this time. There was no attempt at all to follow up on that lead. And if they had, as I say, they would have found that another possible suspect in this case had a brother who had a yellow El Camino. Paul Freshour was finally granted parole after serving 10 years. To this day, 
He maintains his innocence, and he's sure that the real criminal is still at large. I'd really like to see someone really look at this case on the letters, reopen the letter part of it, and get in and find out who wrote the letters. I'd also like to see someone look into this to my former brother-in-law's death. Look, I, you know, that's, that's not my family anymore, and, you know, that's my past. I'm not even going to look back at it. I've got a new family and a new future, but I still would like to see someone look at that accident real close uh, in the letters. The Circleville letters finally stopped, but many questions remain. Who actually wrote the letters? Was Ron Gillespie's death an accident or murder? And who made the booby trap found by Mary Gillespie? If you have any information regarding this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, the incredible story of a primitive sea creature that might live in the depths of Lake Champlain. Tales of a giant sea creature living in Lake Champlain date back to the time when Native Americans lived in the area. Over the years, many have come to believe that the creature is real. There have been hundreds of reported sightings, and the locals have even given it a name, Champ. Sandra Mancy grew up near Lake Champlain. When she was a child, her grandfather teased her with scary tales of the legendary sea creature. Grandfather told us all about Champ, and when we would go fishing, he would say to us, if you don't sit down and behave in the boat, I'm going to throw you over and Champ's going to eat you. Of course, we didn't believe a word of it. <laughs> it wasn't anything that we really believed in. It was just a, a threat. Many years later, Sandra, her two children, and her fiance, Tony, were on a vacation near Lake Champlain. And we stopped at this one place, and the children were down further on the beach having a great time, and Tony decided to go back to the car and get the camera. And I'm looking out at the lake, and the lake started churning. My first thought was scuba divers, but then it's too much. It would be too big of a group of scuba divers, but then fish. There's some very large sturgeon and big walleyes in Champlain, so I thought, well, it's a very, very large school of fish. And then the head and the neck came up out of the water, and then the back. And I watched it turn its head and neck and look around, and when it first came up, its mouth was open, and I could see water coming out of the mouth. And I'm feeling like I shouldn't be there, because to me, this thing should have been extinct 30 million years ago. And even then, I'm not frightened. I'm in total awe and very calm. And then Tony came back, and he saw it. Heidi, right, get out of the water. Get out of the water right now. Come on, get out of And he got all panicky, screaming and hollering. Get up here. I don't know. Come on, get up. And he screamed at me to get back there. So he held me up the bank. And, and when he did, he handed me the camera. And, and I turned around, and it's still there. And I picked up the camera and shook one shot. When Sandra saw the picture she had taken, she was certain that it was Champ. She was equally certain that no one would believe her. So she threw away the negative and kept the photo hidden. Finally, Sandra had the snapshot blown up into an 8 by 10 inch print. She contacted Joe Zarzinski, who had written a book about Champ. Joe sent the print to the University of Arizona to be analyzed. We digitized it and ran all sorts of computer enhancement techniques. We were looking for pulleys or ropes or anything like that, superimpositions, but we found no evidence of hoaxing, and we concluded that that object, whatever it is, was there in the lake at that estimated distance. It wasn't any sort of superimposition. When the photograph was released, it caused a media sensation. The New York Times and Life magazine carried the story. 
Was it really a sea monster? Perhaps Champ was a prehistoric animal that had somehow managed to survive. The object in the Mansi photograph resembled a plesiosaur, which is an aquatic reptile from the Cretaceous about 60, 70 million years ago, long neck and flippers. It resembles that, but that's a long time to have survived. Another idea was that Champ might be a zooglodon, a snake-like whale extinct for 20 million years. Or perhaps Champ was simply a lake sturgeon, which have been known to reach seven feet in length. No matter what it is, ever since the Mansi photograph went public, dozens of eyewitnesses have reported sightings of Champ. Near dusk on a summer day, Walter Tappan, his wife Sandy, and their daughter Heidi were out on Lake Champlain with a camcorder. They were sure they had seen Champ the previous evening. They had hoped lightning would strike twice in the same place. It was a quiet night, just as still as glass, like the first night had been. And I was full of anticipation and excitement, but also not necessarily expecting anything. And for about 10 minutes, we saw nothing. And then Sandy says, Walt, Walt, I think I see one. Get the camera, honey, get the camera. I was manning the camera all the time. And uh, when you look through the viewfinder, you can't see much. So we had quite a time there where my daughter and my wife were saying, there, there, look, look. And I'd say, where? I can't see anything. And at one particular moment, they spotted one not far from the boat, at the most 50 or 60 feet from the boat, and then began the footage for about 20 or 30 seconds of seeing these humps glide along, first two, then three, then four, and then suddenly five, all in a row, stretching out about 20 feet. I had probably, um, I would say, seven different sightings of them. It's bigger, it's even bigger, there are more humps. So I decided to climb up and stand on the sun deck and I just scanned the water. And lo and behold, I saw one of those Brahma bull humps coming along the water and then all of a sudden, the neck and the head came up and it looked right at me. I will never forget it. And I was screaming with excitement, which I wish I wasn't doing because it went down more rapidly came back and then very gracefully, very slowly, went back down into the water just like that. There was no time for me to get the camera and refocus. I'd give anything now to have that on footage because uh, what Sandy saw was, of course, an astounding thing. This creature looking at us and lifting its head out of the water. And what it did was to confirm absolutely for all of us that what we had seen was Chan. Scientific opinion is varied. But at least one expert believes that what Walter Tappan photographed was nothing more than a school of fish. But who can explain the Mansi photograph or the hundreds of eyewitness accounts recorded through the centuries? Do I believe Champ exists? You'll never convince me of anything else. You can call it Champ, you can call it a monster, you can call it a zooglodon, you can call it a plesiosaur, you can call it anything you want. I'm telling you, in that lake, there is something extraordinary. Next, a teenager is mysteriously murdered and her body is thrown into the Platte River. Who committed this brutal crime? Casper, Wyoming. Residents report seeing unexplained lights early one morning on a little-used suspension bridge. Under the cover of darkness, a killer has brought his victim, a young girl of 18, to the bridge. He stabs her repeatedly and then throws her body into the chilly waters of the North Platte River. The victim is later identified as Lisa Marie Kimmel from Billings, Montana. She has been sexually assaulted 
and then killed in a manner that suggested some kind of bizarre torture. Lisa was last seen alive on the night of March 25th, and police believe she was killed just a few hours later. But nearly 1,000 people claim they saw Lisa Marie Kimmel, or at least her car, several days after she was supposedly dead. Lisa Marie Kimmel was 18 years old and living in Denver, Colorado. On March 25th, she left town to visit her boyfriend in Cody, Wyoming, and her parents in Billings, Montana. Lisa's car carried the spunky license plate, Lil Miss. Plan was that she was supposed to leave Denver sometime after work and get to Cody, see me sometime late that evening. I uh, talked to her about 4.30, and she was going to be leaving in about a half hour. I thought she'd be in about midnight or something like that. Weather conditions were good, so Lisa should have made the trip to Cody in eight or nine hours. She was expected at her boyfriend's house late on Friday night. But by Saturday morning, she still hadn't arrived. Ed Jarek anxiously telephoned authorities in three different states. Later, a Wyoming patrol officer reported that he stopped Lisa for speeding the night she disappeared. It was 9 p.m., and she was 60 miles south of Casper. I was patrolling southbound on March 25th. Noted a small car northbound at 88 miles an hour, according to my radar. I turned around and pursued the car. I stopped her near Orrin Junction. She was well kept, kind of person you'd like to have for a daughter. Lisa's signature on the ticket verified her identity. It would be the last confirmed sighting of Lisa Marie Kimmel. As the week went on, we realized the gravity of the situation. The outlook was looking a little grim, but even at that, even if the outcome wasn't as we hoped, we still needed to find her. One week after Lisa disappeared, a man named Greg Bradford went fishing on the North Platte River. When I stepped up off the side of the bank, I looked over my shoulder and I saw the lady in the water. And then I remember when we were driving up from Cheyenne, they said this young girl was missing from Montana. So I looked again and I said, oh my God, it must be her. When we went out there, the physical description matched Lisa, but at that point, because of the condition of the body, we weren't sure until we'd gotten her out of the water. She was found nearly nude. She was sexually assaulted. There were some stab wounds in the chest area. And I can't tell you how they were done to the body, but it would lead the appearance that somebody took their time in doing this. Police searched the area where Lisa's body was discovered. On an old highway bridge, one quarter of a mile away, they found blood that was the same type as Lisa's. Because the bridge is so inaccessible and so seldom used, police concluded that the murderer probably lived in the area. Based on the eyewitness accounts of unexplained activity on the bridge, they estimated that Lisa was murdered early Saturday morning, roughly five hours after she was stopped for speeding. But soon, authorities began receiving information that complicated their investigation. Numerous eyewitnesses reported that they had seen Lisa's car. Some even claimed they had seen Lisa herself. We've had over a thousand sightings of this vehicle, uh, a lot of them from law enforcement officers. And we were deluged with them at the point that we thought they had gone to Canada. We had some sightings in Canada. One of the most reliable sightings occurred roughly 10 hours after Lisa was supposedly killed. Donna Kirkpatrick, the wife of a local county sheriff, reported that she had seen Lisa driving her car in the city of Buffalo, Wyoming. It was Saturday at noon, and I noticed a little black sports car had pulled out right in front of me. Then I noticed a license plate. It was a Montana license plate with Little Miss on it, L-I-L-M-I-S-S. -S -S. And at that point, I decided that I needed to see if the car went with whoever was driving it. I am absolutely positive there was a young gal driving it. I know the license plate. I know Montana license plates. I saw the plate on that car at that time on that day, and there's not a doubt in my mind. 
Two hours later, another eyewitness also saw Lisa in Buffalo. This time, a mysterious man was with her. I was busy at the register, but a car pulled up, and I said, Little Miss, on the Montana license plates on the front of it, and there were two people in the vehicle. There was a very attractive young lady at the wheel. The individual that was with her was a small man, I would say 135 to 140 pounds. A few minutes later, when I turned and looked again, the car had gone. A third eyewitness reported seeing Lisa more than a day after police believed that she was murdered. But this sighting was in Casper, Wyoming, more than 100 miles from Buffalo. Diana Houston was driving through Casper when a car with an out-of-state license plate caught her eye. It was Sunday afternoon, and I saw a Montana license plate on a vehicle. And being from Montana, I had caught my eye, so I looked, and the license plate said Little Miss. I went by, I saw somebody with blonde hair driving, and had on a yellow sweater. There were numerous other sightings of Lisa after her disappearance, but even these three are difficult to fit into the known facts of the case. Lisa was last seen at 9 p.m. on Friday night and reported missing by 9 a.m. Saturday morning. Yet she was reportedly seen twice later that day and once on Sunday. If Lisa was alive, why hadn't she shown up at her boyfriend's house or her parents' house? And if she had been killed early Saturday morning, as police suspect, who was driving the car with Lisa's distinctive license plates. Update. 14 years after Lisa Marie Kimmel was murdered, authorities cracked the case. Their check of the Wyoming DNA database matched an inmate named Dale Wayne Eaton to the crime. When police searched Eaton's property, they found Lisa's car buried underground. Lisa had been held there for six days. Eaton was tried for murder and other charges, and the jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. The sightings of Lisa Marie Kimmel were never explained. Lisa's parents were awarded Dale Eaton's property in a civil suit. They quickly burned the buildings there to the ground. Next, when a motorcyclist loses control of his bike, he is saved by a mysterious Good Samaritan. And coming up, the Shroud of Turin. Is this the actual cloth that covered Jesus when he was buried, or is it a forgery? Naples, Florida. A baby's birth comes with overwhelming joy. For Steve and Sharon Newton, that was certainly the case when their first child, Virginia, was born. It was the most incredible thing I ever seen before in my life to watch this child being born, especially knowing that it was my child. She's got a lot of hair. That's what I always wanted to be was a father, and I just, that she was my world. That's pretty much how I felt with my wife and, you know, I just, they couldn't, they couldn't have gotten any better at that point. That afternoon, Steve left the hospital to go pick up the family car. It was an hour and a half trip to their home in Immokalee. It had been a rainy week, and the storms had left large puddles on the road, creating unseen hazards. It looked like a mirage at first, but it wasn't a mirage, it was water. I remember thinking, this is it, I'm gonna die. I just remember coming straight down on my head. As I hit, I saw, poof, this big bright light, and that was it. Then I was just completely out. Steve ended up in a drainage ditch, face down and unconscious. Are you okay? Can you hear me? I woke up and there's this lady staring me in the face. I remember thinking that this woman was like an angel of some sort. She was just so peaceful, so quiet, so pretty. And I'm gonna stay here with you until I get here, okay? You think you can get up? 
the woman, a passing motorist, stopped when she saw the accident and found Steve unconscious. She quickly turned him over and saved him from drowning. And then she pulled him to his feet and led him to her car. When the paramedics arrived, Steve was in a precarious state. EMS, were you both involved in the accident? No, it was just him. Okay. Sir, do you remember what happened? He appeared slightly confused and he was hyperventilating. The woman was there initially, and since his uh, answers were somewhat disoriented, I asked her what she had found on the scene, and she said that he was face down uh, in, in the water at the roadside, and uh, when she initially went up to him, he was unconscious at that time. He wasn't answering her at all. He easily could have drowned if she had not pulled him from the water. The stranger stayed at the scene until police arrived, and then she disappeared without leaving her name. How you doing, sir? Do you remember your name? 20 minutes later, Steve was brought into the same hospital where his daughter had been born just hours earlier. Steve, are you allergic to any medications? <laughs> Steve survived the accident, but over a year later, he was still disabled and suffering from seizures. Still, Steve knew that without the mysterious Good Samaritan, he would not be here at all. I always knew tomorrow was coming. I always knew that next week was coming. And now I don't take that for granted no more because it could just end just like that. If she could just see my daughter, she'll know that she did me the, the greatest favor or gift that anybody can give, and that's to give me back my life. And I'd like to say thank you for that. Update. A Florida woman watching our broadcast recognized Steve's story as one she had heard from a co-worker named Tammy Dotson. As it turned out, Tammy was Steve's mysterious Good Samaritan. Steve and Tammy met face to face for the first time since the near fatal accident. As a special treat, Steve brought along Virginia, now one and a half years old. Nobody's ever gone that far to come to thank me. And he kept saying that I was his angel. I've never been called an angel before, far from it. But it made me feel good inside to know that I've done something that's helped somebody so much. That day, Tammy and Steve returned to the scene of the accident, all too aware that Tammy's simple act of kindness had changed them both forever. It makes me want to do more for other people. Now, I, you know, I, if someone's in trouble, I would go that extra mile. You know, to, to that extra, just to help that person. I just wanted to hug him. I was so glad to see that he was okay, and the baby, and everything. I was just, just thrilled that he was fine. <laughs> On a previous broadcast, we explored one of the great mysteries of religion, the Shroud of Turin. Does it truly show the face of Jesus, or could it be a forgery? According to the Bible, after Jesus was crucified, he was wrapped in a linen shroud. More than 1,000 years later, this three and a half by 14 foot linen cloth mysteriously turned up in France. It showed the faint image of a man's body, front and back. Ever since, believers have claimed that this was Christ's burial shroud. They say that at the moment of the resurrection, his image was miraculously imprinted on the cloth. When I first began to study the Shroud of Turin, I was convinced it was a crock, and that it would take me probably less than two hours to put away this pious fraud. But I must admit, here I am some 17 years later, I who came to scoff have stayed to pray. My own personal belief is that the shroud is probably authentic. Skeptics regard the shroud as a painting by an unknown Renaissance artist. However, they have a difficult time explaining two things. First, if the shroud is a painting, where are the brush strokes? And second, why does a computer analysis of the image project a three-dimensional picture? more like a sculpture than a drawing. Virtually no other work of art 
has this characteristic. Is the Shroud of Turin really an imprint from Jesus when he died, or is it a painting? Update. Dr. Emily Craig, a forensic anthropologist and medical illustrator, claims that she knows how the shroud was made. Using dry paint pigments ground into a fine powder, Dr. Craig has created an image on cloth similar to the one on the shroud. She uses an ancient technique known as dust drawing. It goes back to cave paintings. It goes back thousands of years. They've used carbon dust and ochres and different natural occurring pigments for centuries. Working first on paper, Dr. Craig applies the dust more heavily for the raised features of the face. The lower areas receive less pigment. Once it's done to my satisfaction, I'm gonna take a piece of linen, you lay the linen down, and then taking any flat, flexible object, we're just going to rub the entire image and make a direct transfer. The image, now on linen, satisfies one of the shroud's main attributes. There are no brush strokes. Dr. Randy Brzee is Dr. Craig's partner. He put the dust drawing through the same computer analysis that the shroud received. The test showed that Dr. Craig's method can produce the 3D properties of the shroud. What we have accomplished, I believe, is that we have demonstrated that a miracle is not required to produce the image on the Shroud of Turin. And it can be drawn on there in a simple, straightforward manner. Emily Craig and Randy Bruzzi believe they have discovered how the shroud was created. However, not everyone in the art world or the religious community is convinced. Perhaps the mystery of the shroud will and should remain unsolved forever. <laughs>